But the truth is, the meta-narrative about the church in this country around gay people is a very, very, very negative one, which is what we all agree about and understand and know. That's what Steve Holmes said to me. Do you know the EA, in taking their stance, still acknowledge beginning and end of what Steve said, that this is the situation. So... It, this won't go away unless we address it. It's no good saying, hey, it's all going really well and let's kind of push the few bad cases into the corner. It's not a few bad cases. Your article, again, in Christianity magazine, addresses just this latest uh, case mm. from that church uh, in Didsbury, who, of course, have sat down, and I think I've, I've looked online at what they're doing. They're going through a whole year process to reevaluate their theology, not just around all the things Ed's talked about, mm. uh, nothing to do with me, but they're going through a whole year's process uh, in the way they re- uh, look at sexuality. In fact, we've invited them, if they are coming, mm. to the open conversation right. that we're running yeah. just to talk about how an evangelical church faced with a death of one of its young people is forced to say, being quiet about this isn't enough. We have to explicitly mm, talk mm. about this issue, reevaluate where we are, and be clear so that the young girls like Lizzie uh, of I the mean, future are not caught in that trap. And I think we've we've both highlighted in things we've written and said in the past that the silence is one of the most damaging things. Mm. And I think there's organizations across the evangelical spectrum and some very prominent church leaders and some very prominent organizations and churches that have basically embraced an appalling silence on this issue, yeah. which is massively right. to the detriment of evangelicalism generally, but also people in their churches. And yeah. you know, that is one of the things that we yeah. we would both want to share yeah. you know, our concern e- on. Even if you, the, the way that you would hope that churches would speak into the situation and, and not be silent is, is to be upfront about the fact that people are going to be experiencing same-sex attraction in their congregation... Would, would you like, I mean, one of the things Sean suggests is, is that he thinks that one way in which churches who do take a traditional stance on this could help is by actually inviting people who have stories like yours, Ed, to come and talk about their experience in a way that I guess, um, although it doesn't betray their evangelical theology, will at least get the issue out into the open and say, you can talk about this, we're open to having this discussion in this church and so on. Yeah, I, I love the fact that, you know, one of the most conservative evangelical churches I know in the country now, whenever this issue comes up in any context, um, you know, talks about, um, you know, how welcome people are who, uh, you know, who are LGBT, um, and also talks about um, the sort of support group that one of their ministers is uh, running to help people that experience same-sex attraction, but also is really clear that that support group isn't sort of, let's put them off in a special sort of category of people with really big problems, but it's just, you know, something that happens alongside church family life in in all its sort of glory messiness, yes. and messiness, yeah. you know, on a sort of daily, weekly basis and, and things like that. So I think, yeah, we do want people to be talking about it. We do people want people to be sharing ex- their experience. And we also do want to be helping people to see that debating this issue and getting clear on all the theological missteps the church has taken across the spectrum, how it's going to strengthen our churches. Mm-hmm. So actually, if we really sort of start talking about what life is like without sex and how you can live life to the full without sex, that helps me in my church family, but it also helps a number of people who are single for whatever reason, single mm. parents in my church family. It helps the widowed and the widowers. It helps the divorced people in my church family. Mm. And the wonderful news is that it is possible to live a very full life without sex. And that seems to be a message the church has lost. In mm. response to the sexual revolution, the danger is we've upped sex within marriage to this sort of thing that's going to solve everything and it brings joy sure, and fullness sure, yeah. in mm. a way that's not going to help me and the 50 percent of the people like me who are single in churches i mean but from your perspective steve you 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 say yeah it's good to have that conversation even in a conservative um you know church as yes but but for you that doesn't quite go far enough presumably because there are going to be people for whom the celibate option isn't an option that works for them in terms of of their life yeah i i I think that's the case i mean a couple of things i'd say um to, to what Ed said there. I mean, it's wonderful to hear about um, a conservative evangelical church that is truly embracing LGBT people and not putting them into some spe- special category that need healing or exorcism. But we know that there are many churches around our country that are evangelical that are still involved in those things. And there are different approaches. You know, people say the Bible's really clear. I was talking to a guy just a few weeks ago, maybe a couple of months ago, you know how time flies by, who was telling me that he was in uh, um, a new church, 
an evangelical church, member of the EA, actually, and um, they prayed for healing for him, and then they'd sat him in front of a pornographic video and prayed that he'd be turned on by it. Blimey, right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so that's very far from this, yeah. and okay. I, I, I trust but, him. But then, of course, there are churches that... that there are lots of different views. There's the kind of church that says, we believe the Bible. It's clear what the Bible says. We need this guy is demonized. There's the kind of church that says, oh, no, that's not what the Bible says. But he does need healing. There's the kind of church that says, no, no, he doesn't even need healing. It's OK to have a homosexual orientation as long as you never do anything about it and you stay celibate. What I'm saying is just the three, just those three views being so prominent show you that there's not half as much clarity okay. about the biblical text it, it, as people lead you to believe. Ed, I mean, I, I, you know, I take it that there are churches out there that, you know, still say that I need to be delivered from a demon, or still say that, that my biggest need is to be sort of healed, or for it to be. I, I mean, in some ways, I think it would be great if we could begin to name and shame these churches rather than always quote how many there are out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, because I think actually that's quite that's quite so, important. Do you know what I've found, Ed, is that in pre I mean, I'm really enjoying this conversation. I think it's brilliant because I think you're, you, the way you talk about this, it's fantastic. But people have got angry with me for naming things. And I, I don't want to name people because I don't think that helps. But if it's your idea, <laughs> perhaps Living Out could compile a list of churches that it thinks well, are, are just making life yeah. tough for gay people. Yeah, well, you know, and I think, I've got some names I can contribute to your. But I mean, and I think, and, and as we've agreed in the past, you know, the biggest thing is the silence. And I think mm. we, we we could certainly both mm. name and shame churches that are just a their 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 sort of official policy means seems to be to say nothing on this mm. issue at all. Because Which, they might be conservative in private, but they're not willing to kind of say that out loud because they're or, or the, aware or they, or the, or the, or the as, opposite as, one. Yeah. 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 And yeah. actually, I think both stances are just display a lack of courage. Okay. Mm. And actually, both stances di display a huge lack of love mm. for people in their church families. Yeah, and respect. And respect that actually they're not willing to... You know, if you're a church pastor, your fundamental job is to pastor and help uh, the people in your congregation become more and more like Jesus. And I mean, if you're not able let, to do let that, me, if the same-sex attracted... Let, let, let me throw one out there. There was a news story a little while back about Hillsong Church, who um, kind of um, were, were asked, I think, in a, in a press conference or something along those lines about what their, their stance was on sexuality and so on. And the, the pastor, in, in, in this case being interviewed, said something along the lines of, we don't talk about it in public. Uh, we only deal with that on a kind of a private level, one-to-one. -one. We don't make public statements about that stuff because it's just not helpful kind of thing uh they got a lot of criticism for that for you know people some evangelical christians saying you need to be you know out there and upfront about your p policy on homosexuality and so on and as far as i understand it they do hold to a traditional uh understanding of sexuality but but they say it's not helpful to kind of do that in public we'll we'll address individual cases because everyone's an individual in a pastoral situation sort of thing what do you make of that kind of approach ed is that kind of is that a good thing or do you think churches should be kind of you know well, saying where they stand in public well at one level at one level you can sympathize can't you because as soon as you say um i believe you know the traditional understanding of the bible that the label that's that's thrown at you immediately in an unhelpful way is the homophobia one and obviously um you know we've got to work with you know we've got to be careful in how we use that word you know there is Stone, we've got a helpful definition of that word, which I don't think sits with a church setting out a biblical viewpoint. But immediately that 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 is thrown, and people mm. fear, you know, all the things that could come from being labelled as homophobic. Mm. So if we can, as we go, agree not to sort of immediately throw the homophobic label at churches that articulate the Orthodox Christian view, but, that would that would help. But otherwise, I don't understand it because Hillsong have got will have people who are same sex attracted in their church family, and I don't think and. They'll be sitting there in silence, and what will encourage them out of their silence is people at the front preaching into this issue, and people at the front saying that this is an issue that they but struggle with themselves. Right. Yeah, so you would encourage them to yeah. do I, do more public to talking say that, about this. To say that it's issue. all done in private means that again it reinforces that what you've got some, something to hide. Yeah, and it's the, the shame <laughs> culture thing. When I yeah. think, well, you know, I can remember being so helped by somebody who at a Christian conference referred to people like me who experienced same-sex attraction but sticking to what the Bible as the heroes of the faith. And it was just a one little line in the talk, but it sort of kept me going for about two years. But, you know, it just acknowledged us in public. Um, when we don't acknowledge it in public, all you're doing is making people feel as if they should be ashamed of it. 
Tune in to Unbelievable with Justin Briley every Saturday at 2.30 only on Premier Christian Radio where faith comes to life. <laughs>